fantastic. I think that might be everybody, Katie. So if you could pop on to the next slide, that would be fantastic. Brilliant. Welcome to this upskilling webinar on filming Dance for Stage. So this webinar is presented by One Dance UK, which is the sector support organisation for dance. And we're also the organisers of the U Dance National Festival 2021. Your session today will be moderated by myself, Laura Nicholson, Head of Children and Young People's Dance at One Dance UK, and also my colleague Cameron Ball, who is the U Dance Festival Manager. And our session is also being wonderfully supported by Katie Stevens, um, One Dance UK's Office Manager, who's making sure all the technical aspects run smoothly and, and making sure that we all stay under control. So we're thrilled to have with us as our guest speaker, the wonderful Craig Bush from TACT Productions who's going to be taking us through some tips and advice on filming dance for stage or in the studio. Craig is Director of Tax Productions, which supplies video content for the arts, culture and heritage sectors. He works with the space to upskill staff in video techniques and he's previously worked as a lecturer with BBC Academy. Craig's recent dance projects include working with Birmingham Royal Ballet, Ron Best School, new adventures and very recently the most gorgeous filming for the One Dance UK Awards which was just beautiful. We hope that from today's session you'll learn some practical creative skills which will enhance the way you film dance which is particularly relevant for You Dance 2021 applications and a little bit more on that shortly. Today's session is a webinar which means your camera and mic are not on and you cannot be viewed and heard by other participants but we will be using the Q&A box to communicate and there'll be a little bit more on this shortly. Next slide please Katie. So before we get started I'd like to tell you a little bit more about who we are and why we're presenting this webinar to you today. One Dance UK is the sector support organisation leading the way to a stronger, more vibrant and more diverse dance sector. We provide one clear voice to support all of those working in the sector to achieve excellence in dance performance, education and management, to advocate for the increased profile and importance of dance in all its diverse forms and settings, to enhance dancers' health, wellbeing and performance, and to identify gaps, provide opportunities and improve conditions for dance to be learnt, discussed and seen. As Head of Children and Young People's Dance, I believe passionately in the power and the importance of dance and its ability to transform and improve lives. We believe that all children and young people, regardless of their starting point, should have access to high quality and free or affordable dance experiences. And the U Dance programme helps us massively work towards those goals. I'll now hand over to Cameron, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about you dance and about how this session will support your applications. Over to you, Cameron. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. You dance is the flagship youth dance program of One Dance UK and is a national program of events offering young dancers opportunities to perform and enhance their knowledge of dance. There are you dance events that take place all over the country. And over the years, these three opportunities to perform and learn have reached over 200,000 young dancers. The U Dance regional platforms are brilliant events which showcase the talents of dance groups in different regions around the country. These platforms also form part of the selection process for the U Dance National Festival, where each region is represented at a huge national celebration of dance at a different host city each year. Diversity and creativity are at the heart of you dance. We welcome choreography in any style of dance and encourage groups from all backgrounds, those with dancers with disabilities and from school groups, youth dance companies, private dance schools, and just really keen individuals. Of course, this year was a bit different. You dance events are very busy with hundreds of young dancers normally traveling and taking part in close proximity to each other. So we had to reformat the way you dance is presented. For the national festival in July, we created you dance digital 2020, which was a free online event and involved 5,000 young people. 2021 will be different as well. So now I'll tell you a little bit more about how you dance 2021 will operate. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. Thank you. 
We really encourage you to create work to apply for UDANCE regional platforms next year, which will be held in the spring. These platforms will be held across the country and all will be delivered online for the first time. You apply to the regional organiser, which is one of the English partner organisations listed here, or to your national contact in Northern Ireland, Scotland or Wales. All of this information is on the UDANCE website. Applications close next spring, so there's plenty of time to create an amazing piece. Each region's dates vary, so please check with your regional organiser. These online regional platforms will be very exciting events. Each will be run in a different way with a uniquely local flavour, but all will showcase videos of youth dance groups in online watch parties and streams. As these platforms are online next year, we are accepting filmed applications in two different formats. You dance on stage for those who can meet in person and film in the studio or on stage. This is the more traditional route for you dance groups. Assuming you can work in a way that abides by government guidelines, you can create a piece in a studio and film this as part of your application. Tonight's webinar, will focus on filming tips for effectively create capturing dance that would ordinarily be presented on a stage. Or your other option is you dance on screen for those who may be working remotely or want to create a dance film. That is a piece of dance that is specifically created as a screen dance to be viewed on screen and not as a live performance. Next week, we'll be delivering a second webinar specifically focused on planning and creating screen dance pieces. So please join us for that as well. These webinars are here to help you to create and submit a high quality video that showcases the talents and efforts of you and your group. The film submission will be that which is showcased on the at the online regional platform. So we want to upskill you and give you the tools to create something brilliant. And if you're watching this and not taking part in UDANCE, that's totally fine as well. There'll be lots of tips for you to take forward in your own work. And now I'll hand back to Laura, who will take you through how today's session will run. Great, thank you. Next slide, please, Katie. So we're really excited to have Craig with us today. And some of you, as I mentioned, will have seen the recent One Dance UK Awards, which Craig was responsible for filming and editing. And I'm sure you'll agree um, the the ceremony looked absolutely gorgeous. Um, you'll also see that Craig's very experienced working with dance and he educates, educates on filming techniques as well. Today's session is being recorded and it will be made available on our YouTube channel for the next few months. So if there is something you miss, you can easily go over it again. If you click on the Q&A icon, you'll be able to type in your questions and we encourage you to use this time to ask any questions you like. Craig will do his presentation and he'll talk you through the various aspects of planning, recording and editing a dance piece. Cameron and I will monitor your questions and generally speaking, we'll ask them at the end of the presentation on your behalf. We will do our best to get through all the questions by the end of the session. Um, and um, if we don't manage to do that, we will be able to follow up afterwards, but hopefully we will get through them all today. Um, so please enjoy and please keep your questions coming in. And I will now hand over to Craig, who will start his presentation. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. Good evening. I'm just going to share my screen. So just uh, give me a second. And I'll just check my screen. Yeah, let's go on. OK, is that showing clearly? OK, I've got a thumbs up. So good evening. Uh, welcome, thanks for coming on. Um, as discussed, we're going to look at filming dance for stage. Now, this is quite an interesting topic because we're looking at transposing mediums here. You've created something that is specifically for a performance and we're taking it to the screen. We have to think about how we're going to play to strengths um, with this. We're going to have to think about how what you've done is excellent and it was done to be viewed from a certain perspective but now you're going to reduce it so an audience is maybe watching it from a phone they're going to watch it from if they can stream it to their tvs and how that affects dance it's just something that we're going to have to keep our eye on all throughout the process and as part of the planning uh, something that 
I always think about when I do work is what can we do in a video that we could not do in a performance? Because you're taking this piece of work that you've worked so hard on, you're having to compromise, you're having to find ways to kind of bring it all together. We have to think about how can we make it so that it really brings across the intentions. They're all there, they're all behind the same piece of work. It's just that we've changed it over to a video format. But we can look at the strengths of that and we can start playing towards that too. So video strengths for dance, I think is always the chance to be more intimate with a performance. You know, if it's an audience sitting there, there may be, you know, 20 meters back or something like that, we've got a chance to be up close and personal. And you've also got the chance to be more explicit with the choreography. You can really focus in on what you think is important. You can show things in a different highlight. Um, so yeah, those I think are the main strengths. Some people may find a different way of working, but we're just thinking specifically here about transposing that piece of what you may already got and putting it on a video screen. We're going to be spending some time really looking at the practical side of doing things. And I'm going to split this up into several different sections. So there's planning, filming, audio and editing. Some of these will be more relevant to you than others, particularly in the audio section, but I've really tried to find, pull out some things that if you are a beginner and you're really looking to just kind of upskill in this way, give you at least some kind of things to think about. And if there's something I'm missing, please do ask. Um, the best tool is planning. And I say this so much and I spend so much time in, and people I work with are so bored of hearing me asking questions, but Planning will lay everything out for you. It will point out all the problems that you've got going down the line. It will make you think about your work and the best way to approach it. It will make you realize the benefits of certain pieces of technology and what you don't want to do as well. So always come back to planning. I can't emphasize this enough. Just think about what you want to do and plan, plan, plan. If you take away nothing from today, and I know there's going to be a lot of little technical bits and pieces, and don't worry, I'll share the slideshow afterwards but please just do plan. Just don't go into this year thinking, oh, we'll set up a camera. Just spend some time thinking about what you want to achieve. And there's some ways to kind of think about planning as well. So what do you want your video to look and feel like? Although we're recording a performance, there are certain things that we can think about on how to present the film. You want to think about what is essential to show. Maybe you don't need the full stage. Maybe you can focus on kind of a certain aspect and focus in on a performance. Maybe there's something that was small that may be missed by an audience before, but you can take the time to really focus on it. Does audio need to be recorded? This will make a massive impact on the way that you can work with dance in the studio or dance in a performance, because you can have it playing out loud, you can talk to each other. This all just comes with planning and it will save you so much time in the filming and so much time in the editing. So just please do plan. Um, the question of what do you want your film to look and feel like is quite an abstract thing. And for people who haven't worked with video before, it may not be something that they've really approached or thought about. So I would really just spend some time looking to other videos for inspiration. Um, just think, have a think about something that you thought could really emphasize or just take bits and pieces from different areas. I do that all the time. I'd always think about, okay, I like that thing and I like this thing over here. How does that work if I bring them together? Or if I work with clients, you know, one of their key references is always in just kind of showing me either things that they've done before or something that they've seen that they like somewhere else. Don't be shy in kind of taking different bits and pieces and mix them together if you think it's going to be best for your performance. Um, yeah, just, sorry, just move on. So just in planning, so some practicalities of planning. So think about where it's going to be filmed, but how, where, and when is really important. So that's obviously kit available to you. We'll go through kit and more things later on, but space and availability. I know this kind of is an obvious thing. You'll know the space that's available to you, but think about light and noise, right? What light do you have access to? Is this a space that just is a practice room that just has windows, therefore, what time of day will be really influential on the look and the light of the film. Also noise, you know, even just kind of doing things in the hat, like if you recorded in your lounge at home, do you have a large, you know, uh, road outside the front of your house? Are you sharing with other people or noisy children, <laughs> kids that are just gonna wander into your room? You've really got to think about these things about when would be best and when it's going to be noisy as well, if you're recording audio. But at least you'll want to have some peace as well. So just taking your time 
think about where it's going to work. Uh, going afterwards as well, so let's say you've got all your materials, you can still think about the planning of how you're going to go to edit it. Are there certain logos that you're going to have to put in and will they be right? If it, The worst thing is having a quick turnaround for a film and someone will send you a logo, your organisation may have a logo or something, they'll send it over to you, but it's not the right one, it's not the right Arts Council logo. So make sure you get that stuff up to front, up front as quickly as possible. If you've got other people sending things over, have a central place for sending them together, a central asset. Uh, if you're mixing audio and visio assets, how, think about how you're going to mix that together. What's the sound quality levels that you need? How are you going to bring it all into one place? Is there one person doing the editing? It's all just general planning. So please, please, please plan, plan, plan. It's really boring, but please plan. Uh, I've split today the majority of things into two sections. And really, I've been thinking about what kit may be available to you and to hand. And I've tried to think about things in the basic sense of things of what's available to everyone. A lot of the tips and tricks that uh, I've applied for in basic kit still applies for larger scale video cameras and for better quality pieces of sound equipment. But this is just something I think is all to hand and maybe we'll make something that's more approachable. There are some more advanced tips as well. If you do have some experience in editing or you have a little bit of equipment or maybe you've got a little bit of budget to buy equipment, just some things to think about. If you want more specific items of equipment, um, please just message and I'll try and I'll give you some tips and point in your direction. Um, so yeah, but first off, we're gonna have a look at filming. I don't know if it's covering your screen, but it says one at the end. So the best cameras are one that's with you. I really just want to emphasize the fact that the most important thing is just filming what you've got. It doesn't matter if you haven't got the latest iPhone, if you don't have the most expensive DSLR. If what you've got is compelling, then the camera that you've got will work for it. You've just got to think about the way that you're filming it. Okay, so just work with what you have. Um, and have a think about how we can get the best out of that. So in filming, the first thing to do is to really experiment with your camera. Phones are great, uh, tablets are great, but there's a lot of quirks to them. There's a lot of things that maybe you'll figure out. You might be able to see, I, I think my picture should be showing up here. So the thing is, there's two different lights in my room. There's my overhead light and there's the light coming off my MacBook now. So the thing is, if you look at my hand and you look around at what I am, I look kind of a pinky white yellow. It's quite weird. Now, the thing is, is that cameras and webcams and stuff like that, they've got auto leveling, they've got auto exposure. And you can turn them off, you can play around with them, but they're gonna, if you just leave them, they're gonna do some weird things. And they're gonna make people look odd because it's playing with two different lights. There are ways of working around them. So what I would do is really just spend some time looking at tutorials on YouTube, there's dozens of them, um, just searching how to get the best settings out of your camera, how things like autofocus works, how things like auto exposure works. Those will be the little things that when, if you leave them on, when you go back to filming or when you review your content afterwards, you'll notice that the autofocus, you know, will suddenly pick out something in the background or the auto exposure, the light changes. So suddenly the auto exposure thinks, right, I've got to really boost things up. I've really got to make this room brighter. And it will ruin your content. You won't have it, you'll, it's basically just giving you more control. This is the main thing, more control you have in your content. And we'll look at some apps in a little bit that will give you that little bit more control, but really it's just learning how to get the best control out of your camera. You always want to have a think about setting it to the highest quality. Uh, in working with some people, I've done some few digital projects where it's been, kind of content has been sent off people and they've really tried to kind of overcomplicate things. They've, they've not quite understood how the best content works together. So just, just because you're filming in the highest frame rate that it says that doesn't mean it's the best. You've got to think about what your final delivery is. Um, if you have 4K on your phone, please do film in that it will be the best delivery and it will be the best your phone has. So, and what you can do in 4K is that when you go into the edit, if you're shooting 4K, I'll particularly emphasize shooting, if you have a wide shot, shoot that in 4K, because you can crop in afterwards. It's something that I do all the time. 
I shoot particularly in a wide aspect ratio, shooting in 4K. And then when we take it into the edit, it means that I've got a whole full stage and I can crop into certain aspects of the stage, move this kind of digital camera, digital fake camera around inside the edit. So it just gives you that much more kind of leeway to it. So if it's just HD, that's great as well. Don't worry about it, it's only 4K if you've got it. But I talked about frame rates, okay? The, the way British things broadcast is 25 frames per second. Americans do it slightly different. Uh, you'll see on your most cameras will have a 23.97 or a 23 frame, 24 frames per second. But most of the things in uh, British transmissions will be 25 frames per second. You don't need to go higher than that. If you start get filming at 50 or 60, those are only really kind of give, going to give you more data than you need. And it's going to make it harder to come to the edit. You can do that if you're filming something in slow-mo. But if we're filming performances here, just focus on 25 frames a second and you'll be safe. There's quite an odd expression of zoom with your feet, not with a camera. And what I mean by that is you've probably all kind of played around with your camera when you want to zoom into something. So you'll pinch and zoom in. Uh, unless you've got something like the iPhone 11, which has multiple cameras, what actually you're doing by zooming in is actually zooming the digital image. It's not a camera lens doing that. So every time you zoom in, you're actually degrading the image. So rather than doing that, just try and find, a, use that as a last resort, I should say. Try and find a way of positioning your camera back, pulling it back to give a wider angle. So that's what we mean by zooming with your feet. Really, we wanna do everything we can to give you the best quality possible. And anytime you pinch, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it will slightly degrade quality. So just keep to that if you can. Lighting really is the infinite issue and problem. Um, you'll never get around it, but you've just got to think about how you want to how you want it to look. And lighting is the biggest influence on that. It's the biggest influence on tone, on contrast, on just what people can see, because the camera is what is picking up that up. So really just spend some time uh, thinking about working with what you have. Okay, if it's only, if the light in the studio that you've got is just some overheads, fine, so be it. How are you gonna get the best image out of that? If it's some windows, then you are gonna have to think about how those windows affect your lighting. Uh, there's a mixture, there's a, I talked earlier about the kind of light in my office and the light that's coming off me from the front. So those are called color temperatures and uh, after the, after the uh, slideshow here, I can do a little, little demonstration of kind of what kind of temperatures do to kind of the extreme. But if you've got some overhead lights and you've got some light coming through a window, that's gonna cause some conflict. That's when you start getting kind of odd orangey, pinky, yellow kind of skin tones and things start being a bit weird. So I would try and pick one light source and run with it if you can. Um, really just spend some time experimenting about finding dark patches in your room as well. The, the room may look light all around, but the way your eye sees and the way a camera sees is quite different. This, the camera will pick up more subtle differences in light. So really just kind of set up where you want the camera to be and then just record yourself or have someone monitoring and walking around the space. Find out where the dark spots are and if you can put more lights on, great. If you can't, Think about the ways that you can compromise with that and maybe bring dancers in closer, maybe move things back, or maybe the camera shifts over a bit for this shot and pulls things forward. So just spend some time experimenting, see how the light works with your camera as well. Okay. And so next up, we're gonna think about the ways of really getting the best out of your work in a, in a performance. And that really is using as many cameras as you've got. Obviously, you'll have an idea of what you want the performance to look like because we've done our planning, so we've thought about that. So really, kind of multicams will give you uh, some options on the way of focusing in on the performance and being able to switch between angles. The biggest thing really is being able to hide mistakes, right? We're never going to get everything that we want and we're going to have to run everything twice and maybe think, okay, well, if I shoot from that angle, it may kind of cover things. and using multicams to cover a performance will give you that. Okay, it will give you more kind of perspectives as well to kind of edit between and make you feel dynamic. 
It will give you the chance to go from a big wide shot where there may be a number of people on stage to just cutting into that intimate moment. And just having several cameras set up at once, and when I say cameras, I just mean phones or tablets, kind of set up at once filming things, it will just give you that different perspective. And also it means that let's say something goes wrong on the wide shot, there may be two people who, oh, they've come in too early and they duck out again, but you've only got this chance for the one take. If you've got a close-up shot, you can go into that. You can go into the close-up shot for that moment and then go back out to the wide when they come into the right time. It's a big thing. Video is a lot of covering mistakes. And particularly when things are so precise, like in dance, when people want to be on time, people have to be in the performance on time, people things shift in time. Multi-cameras just give you that little bit of leeway. Multi-cameras also give you a bit of a problem and obviously bringing it into the edit, how do you sync that up? Now there's, I think everyone's seen a film when they have the clapperboard at the beginning. What that's actually doing is syncing up audio and sound, but it's doing visually. So that means when they take it into the edit, because they're recording audio and sound differently, they can sync it up. So when they see the clap go hit, that's the same as when the sound is making the noise. But what you can do on a camera as well is as long as both cameras are recording and you can do exactly the same thing. And as long as both cameras can see you do a clap, you know that precise point to sync it up. So that will just save you a lot of time in the edit. It can be annoying to kind of sometimes remember things and you may have something set up with particular angles, but just finding a way to really sync those cameras together and making sure that when you take it into the edit, it just saves you that little bit of time and messing around. Okay. Um, something that's unique to dance is really thinking about angles. Now, this is a performance, so you, you've got to think about what's the way that you want the audience to see the performers. When we go into, it's, if we have a typical theatre and we're watching it from the auditorium, everything in the dance is played out in that particular way to the auditorium, kind of straight, flat, straight on. It gives a theatrical style view, but we're making a film. How can, in film, can we work with different perspectives? Can we maybe kind of jump from different angles and move that around? Um, but you've got to think about the way that affects the choreography as well. It may not be as complementary, going from one angle to another. You've got to really think about, again, planning. You've got to really think about what you want from the performance and what will set different cameras up at different angles what benefit would that give you to the performance? If there's none and you just need a wide for the whole show, you just want it to feel it theatrical in that way and have a full stage, really kind of just think about, okay, well, if it's the same level of the dancers, how's that going to be different? So then we've got to think about the camera positioning as well. So we've got to think about how the dancers proceed. So as soon as you start raising or lowering a camera, it will change the way the dancers look. So if you look, if you have the camera low looking upwards, it gives more imposing view, it makes the legs look longer, the person will look, the dancer, the rest of the body and the head will look further away. If that's something you want, great. Uh, if it's not, then don't include it in the film and think about maybe raising the camera, usually chest height is the best way to do it because if we're focusing on the face, if we look at something like ballet, that's very kind of about keeping upright and straight. So chest height is the best complement to that. But you may be doing something where dancers go down to the floor and you may want to think about something complementing that. But rather than tilting the camera down to the floor, think about, well, actually it would look better if the camera, actually your eye line was down with the floor. We've really got to think about the positioning of the camera and the, the wide shots really are where people have to make a lot of compromise. A lot of people, especially in theatres, to get a full wide shot, you have to bring the camera back, which means you're actually going higher if it's rake seating which means as soon as you go higher, you start looking down and it starts changing the perspective. It's nice because it gives you a fuller sense of the stage. And if there's lots of dancers, you can see rows back and what they're doing, but it also blocks out the way the kind of dancer's feet may be moving because you can't, it will be, the timing will be just be, you feel a bit different because you're looking down on the dancers then. So any kind of things that the legs lift up won't look as ex, uh, accentuated. Lots to juggle, lots to think about, but this all just kind of comes across in your planning. Really just think about what you want, and I'll keep saying it, uh, planning, 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 do your planning. 
Um, really another piece of planning is thinking about sections and coverage. This is something that recently I worked on a production and we had a full orchestra. We we're very fortunate to have that uh, going along with the performance. And they wanted to run several bits again because either the orchestra weren't happy with it or the, the dancers weren't happy with it. So they thought, right, we'll just do from bar 48 to bar 56 again. But we had to kind of put a complete stop to that because the thing is, an orchestra is never going to be in the same time. If you've got live music, it's never going to be in the same time. Dancers will never be that precise ever. It's just not possible, especially when there's kind of moving time signatures and things like that. So really the best thing to do is to cut your, if you want to run the sections of the piece again, is to cut up larger scale sections. Think about when there's a pause, when there's a slower point and do from that beginning to that end of that section. And that may be a few minutes long, but it will just save you so much time in the edit. If you, obviously, I'm talking about an orchestra here, if you have music and you're working to a tempo, that makes things easier. But anytime you do anything that will interrupt that, so maybe that is if you have speaking or if there's some sort of live element to it or there's some sort of improvisational element to it as well, um, it will completely change your kind of timing of it. So really the best thing to do is to work in sections and figure out what you believe is the best section, uh, best section that you performed, best take. I should say that you performed at that. It's really tough and it can be really demanding, but in order to kind of get things working in the edit and just to make sure things time up perfectly so you can cut between cameras if you need to, I'd really just spend some time thinking about that in filming. Uh, coverage is kind of going to something a little bit different, but will give you the same benefit. So when um, a while ago, I did some filming with a ballet company of, uh, Signets uh, from Swan Lake, because that's four dancers working perfectly in time with each other. It's extremely hard to do. And they did one full performance, but the thing is they couldn't do the same thing in time again, perfectly. It's, it just wasn't, even though we were doing it to the music, it just wasn't possible. So what we thought is that, okay, they're, they're too exhausted, they're too tired to keep running this again. What if we just do a run through that is certain sections of the feet or certain sections of the head or certain, maybe just two of the dancers running through and one, their legs could just be walking, but we just focus on the head. If people are watching it and it works and it feels right in the edit, people won't notice that for that one section, you know, you're not getting everything that you may have wanted to. And it means that you can cover up the mistakes. When we did the first one through, it looked great, but a couple of moments, their heads turned just a little bit slow, but it means that we could cut to that tighter shot of just their heads turning perfectly in time. So just think about ways of kind of maybe going in a bit tighter if you need to, if you think things are gonna be really tough and there's a way of getting around it, it's just spending that little bit of extra time. It may not be exactly what you want in the choreography, but this is, we're compromising here. We're making something onto film and it's a performance. We've got to understand it's a performance, not everything is going to be perfect, but we want to get it as close as possible. And we want to get that feeling of the performance across. Um, just some more advanced look at filming. So if you, I talked about the way you're going to get the best out of your cameras, out of your tablets and iPhones, is really thinking about kind of control. So an app, which is 999, it's called Movie Pro. It's available on Android and on iPhone as well. That will just give you basically DSLR kind of level of controls. And it will be able to just push the kind of level of production that you've got. And it will give you a bit more kind of quality as well in your output. Um, what you can do with that as well is that if, you're, if you have some experience in filmmaking, you'll understand about kind of flat profiles and color profiles and things like that. And that will give you that on your phone, which means that you'll just get a little bit more in control in your kind of coloring grading. That's something to maybe work towards and experiment with, and it may not be of use to in your film, but if you want to start looking at getting better in your filmmaking, and it'll also be a bit of a stepping stone to working with DSLRs if you have those as well. Uh, looking at kind of extra equipment, we are, if we're looking at stage performances, that you can get some lights. But the thing is, if it's a stage performance, if it's in a studio, 
I would check the size of the light before and also what impact that could actually do to it. If we're thinking about that, there's five of you on stage, an affordable LED, LED light won't probably be powerful enough to kind of add that much to it. It may be enough to kind of add a little bit of accent to the feet if your stage lighting is not kind of powerful in that way or you're kind of lighting enough in the rooms in that way. So I definitely look at kind of benefits of getting some more lights in, but really it's about kind of thinking about how you can use that light. Something that I, we've done before and we did it for the One Dance UK Awards was that we had stage lighting, but when we went in to be do close-ups so, and people talking, what we did is we used an actual just kind of LED light just so we had that bit more control and just so we could make the kind of skin tones and things like that just pop a bit more control, a um, bit nicer. So really it's about the way of using that. If you do have some close-ups and LED light, maybe something that will help you with that. Diffusing light is something that you could do a whole workshop on and it's, uh, but really it's thinking about the easiest example is that if you've got a big window in your rehearsal room, and uh, maybe it's got loads of nice light coming in during the, day, during the day, but unfortunately if it's direct sunlight and you've got window panes, there'll be the elements in between the window panes and that will cause harsh shadows on the floor. And it may cause too harsh light on people when you're dancing in performance. Diffusing light means that just putting a piece of cloth or not necessarily a curtain, because a curtain is there to block out light, but just having something over the front, a thin gauze, and what that will do is that will diffuse the light. Some light will still come through, but it will give you what's called a soft light, and it will just be far more complementary, and it will just fill out the light of the space and won't be as harsh on people. It takes a lot of experimenting to find out what works, but if you're having real issues with that, uh, something that people often use are bed sheets and things like that. Uh, a towel or something would be too thick. But if you think about the material of a bed sheet and just kind of using that uh, framed in some way or kind of clipping it to the windows, that can really just kind of give you a nice soft light. Tripods are something that I put in extra equipment because not everyone has them, but it's really important, especially if you want to do fluid panning. So if you're following performance on a stage, I really think about investing in a tripod or some sort of mount for your tripod for your iPad or phone if you're using that. A wide angle lens, and you can get these really nice kind of snap on about 30 pound wide angle lens. If you feel that it's too constricted in your space and you don't have the chance to move back, um, just getting these kind of little snap on screw on lens mounts for your cam for your iPhone or tablet or something. They're really good quality. And usually you can get a couple of other kind of, if you get um, a decent mount, you can get a kind of couple of other lenses like a telephoto lens and stuff like that. And the quality is pretty up there. You know, a lot of people won't notice the difference and you can start getting depth of field with it as well. So getting some nice kind of blurry backgrounds and just playing around with that. Uh, if you've got any more specific questions on that side of advanced film, please just ask and we'll answer them at the end. Um, something that's obviously just as important as filming is audio. All right, there's a nice little, or it's not the gear, it's the ear and that's, it's all about what sounds good. In the same way as the camera that we have with you is the best one, it's about what you can hear, right? If people can hear you and people can hear the music and people can hear what voices are being said, they'll follow the story. They'll pick it up and they'll go along. If it's muffled, if it's muffled and it's not clear and the music's too loud and they keep on having to change things up and down and trying to go, what, what were they saying? then that's going to ruin the story and it will take them out of it. So audio is really, really important. And you've got to think about how you're going to use audio and music. Um, in the space, obviously, we're going to have to think about how you want to hear that music. Is it just something that you're going to drop in afterwards? Or is it going to be something that you can record on your cameras um, just in the space, but really you know that you're going to drop out and you're just using it for audio syncing afterwards. But as soon as we start playing music in the space, obviously that causes a conflict if anyone's talking or anyone's singing. So how are you going to work with that? We're good, we've got to figure that out with our planning because we don't want any bleed over of speakers into any microphones. Um, so we've got to think about synchronizing to make sure the music is clear as well. Uh, you've got to think about recording uh, the talking and singing. So 
it's a it's a tough thing to do. I mean, it's obviously there's whole career, people with whole careers are just kind of recording audio for TV shows and things. And the thing that I would never overlook is the quality that you have in your pocket. Uh, I've <laughs> recently we did a voiceover for a piece, and there was um, we did a really clear mic uh, in a studio voiceover and it sounded great and then we got the files and there was an issue with one of them and we didn't have time before it went out to kind of go and book the audio uh, the suite again and to get our talent in again so what we had to do is to basically get them to record an audio note on, on their iphone just using their just kind of iphone mic and send that over to us I mean, it wasn't that far off. There was a little bit more reverb um, than we'd like. I had to get a real, little bit of hiss reduced on it. But the audio quality of the microphones that you've got on your iPhone and things like that are really high. Um, the thing I think about with them is just about where you're going to position them on you. So clip mics, so keeping them nice and close to the performer is really, really important. But there's apps that can help you. You can monitor levels and you can have a look through that. Um, but really, we should think about how we're going to get started. I know there's a lot of writing on here. Again, you'll get access to the slides afterwards, so don't worry about that. There's just lots of things that you should consider. And really, it's about getting quiet room. I discussed that in our planning. Um, there'll be lots of noises that you might not be able to pick up, but they'll as soon as you get in the edit, they'll ruin your day. Um, there's things that may not be instantly uh, available to you to kind of block out, but there's ways that we can work on that and there's ways that we can plan, uh, plan around that. Really, it's thinking about uh, the same about light that I mentioned earlier. How's time of day going to affect things? Are people going in and out of your house? It does the studio that you practice that, is that next to a school or something like that, that at 3.30 you've got a thousand kids going past and having a laugh. Um, there's things like air conditioning or electric buzzes, right? You can't, your mind will block them out day to day, but as soon as you press record on an audio device, it will pick them up and it will be in the background all the time of your recording. So really it's about doing some testing, finding some, getting the mics that you're gonna use, listening back as well. That's the most important thing is not just listening through the mic that you've got, but listening back and just doing some testing, listening to yourself talking in the space and finding just kind of what might work. There may be some things like um, you want the sound of feet on the stage. You want that sound of kind of that scuffing, that energy of it. Well, how does that sound in the space? How close do you have to put the mic to hear in order to hear that? And that goes for the same rule as speak up, right? You want things to be clear. So make sure that when you do some audio tests, when you kind of put mics onto people, hear how they sound on the mic. Is something not right? Is there something rustling around too much? But make sure they speak up and make sure that those lines are clear. The louder you are, the more it's going to pick up on your mics and the better it's going to record it. Um, for a more advanced type of thing, I would think about blocking some unwanted un un sound. We talked about using bed sheets for windows for diffusing light. Well, if you've got your duvet with you, you can cover doors with that. Uh, something that's quite often done when recording audio is creating, if, it's, if you're on location, creating smaller spaces. Um, if you have access to curtains or something like that, or maybe there's a large scale curtain which goes around one side of your studio, maybe blocks out some mirrors or something like that, pull that across because that's going to stop any reverb that's going to stop any and it will baffle some of the sound just think about again what if you don't have that access to you then just work with what you've got don't worry about it but just think about kind of enclosing the space and things that you can do to benefit that maybe there's some audio that you have to put in as a voiceover afterwards and how can you create a smaller space to make it more intimate to stop any audio bleed the thing that people often do with that type of thing just as a point of how important this is, is I've got a friend who's a voiceover artist and he often travels and whenever he gets a job, a job in, he's got his microphone, his nice quality microphone that he takes everywhere. And if he gets a job in, what he does is he asks the hotel for extra pillows 
and he creates a little fort around himself and he's got his microphone under there and the fort just baffles some sound for him. So looking at advanced things, just kind of monitoring your levels. So Movie Pro app will actually give you some audio monitoring. Uh, using a microphone, so getting a, a lav, which is a clip mic, some of you may know that, or a directional mic. So that means that the audio is only going to pick up what is directly in front of it, but you may want an omnidirectional mic. Omni means picking up everything all around the mic as well. But really it's about what you want to do with that audio and how you want it to be picked up. Something that's uh, being used a lot is using a, a phone as a second recorder. Um, so that's just in the space or giving that uh, phone just on a person close to them out of shot. And that can work as a backup audio recorder. So you may have something that's going direct into the camera, but just having one around, around you that you've got spare, just putting it on your audio memo notes and just using it as another recorder. There are audio recorders that you can put money towards. Uh, so they'd start really kind of about 80, 90 quid and they'll just work over USB and they'll just improve that, again, that little bit of a level up. The more you spend on the recorder, the more you can use things like lab mics and stuff and more inputs into them. So it will benefit you to spend that little bit more. But if you want, again, if you want some recommendations, just uh, send a question in and we'll answer if we can. We're going through this really fast, guys. I'm throwing a lot at you, but again, just the slide and just uh, will be sent to you and there's some questions afterwards. Uh, we're gonna look at editing. I'm gonna move this up. <laughs> there. Uh, yeah, this is a, a quite relevant quote to me um, by Martin Scorsese and You'll always find, as soon as you go into the edit, there's things you missed, there's things that you wanted to do differently, um, and it's tough. You have to compromise on things, and what may be have been your favorite shot when you did it doesn't turn out to be work as well in the edit. So just be prepared that things are never gonna go as well as they seem. Something's always gonna happen, some glitch will happen, someone on your favorite shot will be out of time, but our job in the edit is to make it slick, it's to make it work so that the viewing audience don't even realize that there's a problem, right? The amount of projects that I've done where people have mistimed something and we've had to cut to something else, but the, the viewing audience has no idea, right? They just feel it's part of the show. And as long as it feels part of the show, as long as it feels part of the edit, no one will know any different. So in... Oh, excuse me. Uh, in the edit, we've got to think about our approaches. So you've got the raw material and you want to bring that together. That's the, really the best way to kind of think about edit is that we've been out, we've got all these different elements and all these different bits and pieces. We've got logos and titles and things like that already. How are we going to work it together? Well, if we've done our planning, it shouldn't be too bad. It shouldn't be too hard. We thought about the kind of story arc of the plan of the film. So the first thing we're gonna do is work to that. We're gonna follow that story structure that we thought about with our performance and the way it's gonna work. Um, so the first thing you really need to do before putting in any sort of editing platform is watch through your footage and take some notes about what worked, what didn't work, which take was best. Actually, the bit from that take could work nicely on that type of thing. And it will just make you more at home with the footage. Um, if you filmed it in sections, again, think about how you can maybe add those moments in. And if they don't work, just let, let them go, right? The biggest thing you can do in an edit as well is just letting things go. It's really tough to do because you may have spent so much time thinking about them, but just thinking about what could work and what couldn't work is really, really important and just letting things go. If they don't work, forget about them because you'll always notice problems, right? And editing is problem solving. And now you're gonna to have to compromise more than ever. And there's gonna be a lot of voices maybe on what you do. You're gonna to have to work with choreographers, dancers may think differently, but it's a compromise. You have what you have and you can't get around it. So really it's about me spending that time to think about what's best. And unfortunately with editing, it's something that just comes with practice, right? It's just something that you need to, uh, work with. So that's called editing by feel. Uh, 
it makes sense in exploring and doing it, right? It's a game of trial and error. You'll be able to just kind of put two pieces of edited footage together. You'll be able to put cut in a moment in a performance. Maybe you cut on movement, maybe you cut on stillness. Just see what works. And the thing that kind of really works for me at the moment um, is thinking about the way the audience is going to watch it. So I really spent some time uh, putting footage out, seeing what it looks like on my phone, if that's where it's going to end up, if it's going to end up on social. Uh, putting things on YouTube as well, because I want to know how YouTube is actually going to work with the footage as well. Seeing how it affects the quality, seeing how the aspect ratio looks in that player. Because unfortunately in these days and age, you know, people are more often not going to be watching it through that rather than watching it on a screen. So you want to see how that feels and play to those benefits. Think about how your audience is watching it. Take notes, try again. And it's a circle until you feel it's right. Uh, there's some things that you can work with, some uh, different software, but really get used to kind of watching things back on your phone. Your camera roll for kind of reviewing things is really, really good. Um, and if you, if you are filming on your phones, on tablets and things like that, and you're going to be editing on there as well, try and cut down your camera roll. Always save it as a new file. When it gives you a video, it gives you the option to clip original file or save it as a new file. Always clip as a new file because you don't want to get rid of all that possibly kind of nice moments around it. But it just means that it will save time when it goes to the edit. Edit all these edit platforms and editing software and things like that. They are pieces of software that'll be functioning and they'll be having to search through the footage as well. If you're only taking in the selections and moments that you like, it just means that the editing software is going to only have to work with that rather than hunting through that all big piece of footage and slowing it down. Um, I mentioned editing software, so there's something, a couple of apps that I really recommend to get started. Um, so Splice, it's free, it's on the App Store. There's loads of, there's a great tutorial to it, which will kind of just get you through all the basics. It is limited to some sort of templates and things like that, and you have to figure out how to switch things off. So sometimes it will say like uh, edited on Splice at the end. So just learning how to kind of switch those things off. But as a piece of software, it's very impressive. The same with InShot. If you want to start developing a bit more with InShot, the app, uh, you do have to do some in-app purchases. It's not the worst purchase in the world, and they just give you those kind of little bit of extras. But the important thing is working with those type of apps will make you understand how non-linear editing works. And if you're just putting things out for social and if you're really comfortable working on an iPad, they'll give you what you need to get started. Um, if you work on a computer, iMovie is always there. It's really simple to use. There's so many tutorials on it and it does the job and it will get you a video which will look at decent quality online. Uh, if you don't really like uh, iMovie, as a platform, then I'd really recommend uh, OpenShot. It's made by the same people who made InShot. Uh, it's free as well, but really just kind of, it will give you, again, that extra stepping stone to kind of understand video editing a bit more if you want to get into it. Uh, there's a bit more kind of more professional if you start moving up. Um, so LumaFusion is a really, uh, good inexpensive editing uh, software. Uh, it's $29.99 and it's an app. Um, and it will just give you that kind of extra playroom, extra wiggle room, give you a few more, everything from kind of the way you do titling is a bit better. The way you can do transitions is just a bit smoother and the output quality is a bit better. It is an expensive thing to invest on for just an app. So play around with the free apps if, you, if you're just beginning before investing 30 quid. Um, but for desktop as well, there's some great free editing softwares. Lightworks, fantastic. It will teach you nearly everything you need to know about kind of uh, editing before you start investing in things like Final Cut or Premiere Pro, which is a large kind of scale investment or kind of an ongoing subscription in the case of Premiere Pro, which you may not want to do. But Lightworks will get nearly everything done for you. They're open source software, they're all constantly being updated and you can make a polished film out of it. Um, 
I've talked a lot and my voice is starting to go. Um, so thank you. Uh, if you want to find out more about me or drop me an email, so it's tapproductions.com or hello at tapproductions.com. Uh, I hope you've got something out of that. I hope there's some questions as well. Um, yeah, I've asked a lot. And yeah, there you go. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, and we do indeed have a few questions coming in, so we're going to have to keep you talking for a little bit longer. No, no, no please. I apologise. Um, so the first question that's come in from Adele is, um, do you have a recommended link for a wide angle lens for iPad or iPhone, please? Yes, I do. Uh, I'll bring it, well, I'll find it and I'll bring it over you. Adele, if I can put that in either the chat window, if I can bring it up, or as part of the review after this, I'll send one over if that's all right. But yes, there's some, uh, in this case, I know it's getting to Christmas and everyone's bombarding Amazon, but Amazon is your friend in this stuff. Usually the reviews are pretty accurate on there and you'll be able to see the ones that have got hundreds of reviews, it's the same with tripods, it's the same with grip, but really uh, going through Amazon, because the clip-on lenses and stuff like that, you're going to find very few that I'd buy. Um, so there's a, a company called Wex or anything like that, which are, or b &A Video, which are kind of more specialized video companies and really they don't stock that type of stuff. So really, I would just keep on Amazon and have a look at reviews, but I'll find the link for the one that I like and I'll put it over. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, we have a question from Sasha, which is how do you re reduce the grainy feel from the video? Oh, that's it. So what's happening there? Uh, in case, just in case, Sasha, you don't know, and uh, sorry if you do know this, but just for everyone, what's happening there in grainy video is that the camera or the processing unit is, doesn't have enough light. So what it's happening, having to do is it's having to up the sensitivity of the camera and it's doing its best. And all that graininess is the camera, is the, sorry, the actual processor really trying to make sense of it. But since there's enough, not enough light, it just goes in a circle and once it's recorded like that, there's not that much you can do about it. You can get a piece of software if you wanted to invest in it called Neat Video, um, but I'd only really invest in that unless you were using Premiere Pro or Final Cut because that is a piece of professional software. If you are looking at um, archive footage, so if that's part of your project, you're getting footage from Maybe that was converted from VHS or film and you want to update it. A piece of the software, neat video is really good. There are things on Premiere Pro where you can reduce noise, but what you're going to get is it's going to lose detail as well. So anything that's kind of on beards or any kind of like skin tones and stuff like that, it's going to do like one of those um, beauty filters you see on uh, Instagram. It's going to basically do the same as that. Um, the best solution, and it, I don't know if this is that helpful, is to get more light. It means that the camera will have to do less work and it will, can reduce that kind of boosting element to it. Um, so really just look at ways of improving more light. If you look at Movie Pro app, because the thing is, uh, on Movie Pro, what you can do is you control the iris of the camera. And what you can do is you can set the iris so the iris is open up wider, it's letting in more light. And that means that you can bring what's the IS, you, there's the iris and ISO, and you can bring the ISO back down again and try and play with that. ISO is the sensitivity of the camera's sensor. And the higher the ISO, the more you're gonna get that blocky graininess. So hopefully in being open, being open and taking it off auto exposure, being able to set the iris, it will reduce that graininess down, if that makes sense. Cool. Thank you, Craig. Um, I've got a question here from Laura, who says, thank you so much for um, so much information. And she's got a question about working with iPhone. Um, she said it goes to 0 0.5, so that more of the stage can fit on the screen. Will mm -hmm. this mean that the quality of the video then won't be as good? No, it will be, it will, that will be fine. The only thing that you've really got to think about when you start going that wide is the fact that distortion right so anytime you put uh 
I'm going to go to an extreme here. So if you've ever seen what's called a fish angle lens, and that means that anything in the middle it starts looking close up and anything that's around to the side kind of pulls away. And that's because the, the angle of the lens is so wide. So it starts actually bending light to the sides. The same problem is going to happen when you film a, a wide stage and you use a wide lens is that things to the side will actually start squeezing and looking smaller and things in the middle will look uh, larger. And it means that also the rates that people look like when they're moving are different. They'll move faster uh, to the sides and as they come in, they'll start moving slower. So really, it's not, you know, I use wide angle lenses all the time. I'm not uh, pushing off the purpose of wide angle lenses. My thing is just to just be aware of what it does to your image. And if it's all you've got, don't worry about it. The 0.5 on iPhone, great. And it won't degrade the quality at all. But you've just got to be aware of how that affects the picture that you're going to get as a result. Thank you. I've got a question from Romy, which I imagine might be similar to a lot of us who are working online for the first time and making dance films for the first time. Um, if you are making your first film, how do you plan if you don't necessarily know what you're doing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> you make it up as it goes along sometimes and which can be time consuming when the planning side of things yeah but the the aim really is um in planning is to save time you put all that time up front so that when you come to making the film you save time in figuring out what you want during filming and you save time in the edit because you already kind of know what you want um really i would i would start by just writing every single thought that you have about the film. That's everything from uh, look, feel, tone, textures of the film, look at other films that you like, um, refer to them, think about how long they are, how long does it go on for, how does it feel that it works for that length, how do you want done, how your performance will work as a length, do you want it as a naturally frame performance, or do you want to kind of break it up so it feels more tonal and atmospheric? Um, and start drawing as well. And it doesn't, you know, it, going back to Martin Scorsese, if you want to see something really interesting, you know, Martin Scorsese's seen Pete Lord is one of the best film directors. His storyboards uh, are stick men and arrows pointing around and things like that. So when I say drawing, I don't mean like, oh, it has to be these beautifully rendered things of the way light's gonna fall off them. Just think about it like it's a cartoon. A lot of films, they'll what they'll do is they'll storyboard it and then they'll get some music and they'll create what's called an animatic. And basically it's the storyboard. So you when you watch it, you can start feeling how things will flow in the length of it and start feeling, okay, well, this will hold, we'll hold this for this amount of time. If you've already got the music in mind, that's even better because you can start thinking, you can start playing it back in your sketches or in your head and you can start realizing, oh, actually this holds for a little bit too long. This music note, we can't keep that for the amount of time. Um, so yeah, just have a brain dump and just get everything out first and try and think about how you can flow that, how images will look, what will be kind of, and also it, it will make you be brutal, which you have to be in your work. You really have to cut things down because any time that you're not brutal, you're going to add time to filming, you're going to add time to editing, right? And you're going to make yourself feel worse in that time. So the more brutal you can be up front and the more you realize, mm, I'm not sure about that, just get rid of it, cut it out because otherwise you're going to spend a lot of time and you're going to work in the edit and have to cut it out anyway. So yeah, be brutal. Great, thank you. And um, we've got a question from Isabel who also said thank you very much for a brilliant session. Um, I think this question will also resonate with lots of people. Um, have you got any advice on rolling or moving angles, i.e. what to use, how to make them clearer than just walking around with a camera in hand and angles jittering all around? <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's um, you know, more uh, there's things like which I use a lot, which are gimbals at the moment, right? And that's an investment. You know, there's it, it'll cost you a bit of money and it'll cost you a bit of playing around. Um, 
They they are making more and more gimbal sandwiches specifically for phones that are relatively inexpensive. Uh, a company really to look at, which is not the cheapest company, it's called DJ, DJI, the, um, which are kind of at the forefront of making gimbals. Uh, but they are an investment, and I'm not saying again you have to fork out all that. Really, it's just about getting started and getting rolling with things. Amazon is your friend with this type of thing, especially at this level. Um, if you start looking at more and you're wanting to spend more, then I would look at more specialist stores. But Amazon, use the reviews. People try things out. People recommend on there. And if you don't want to buy from Amazon, which is actually fair enough, you can usually find other sellers online just using the same thing, using the name of the gimbals as well. Um, apart from that, I mean, the cameras, there's certain cameras these days which are getting, uh, it's called, if you look at, um, Sony, so I'm just looking at because I can remember what the range is called. But I've got a Sony camera, and there's two factors in the in my Sony camera. Um, one is the lens, and you can get what are called um, steady shot or image stabilizer lens, or you can get uh, I think it's steady shot in the Sony, um, and it actually means that there's a, basically a mini gimbal inside the actual camera itself, and that will steady it. So you will be still doing handheld but it will just give you that extra bit of smoothness to it. Uh, <laughs> if you ever work with a, a camera operator who's um, decent at gimbal use or just good, what they'll start doing, and there's tutorials on this online, is, is duck walking. They'll do this sort of little hunched, uh, <laughs> just kind of half squat walk, where what they're trying to do is they get their hips level. And so they're not born, when you walk, you bob up and down. But, we're dancers here, so it's about getting the hips level. And they'll do this sort of semi-squat walk, and, it'll, and it looks really funny. It looks sort of like that they need the toilet or their trousers are falling down or something like that. But it just keeps them nice and level. And learning how to do little movements like that will help you. Or learning how to take a wide stance and moving your hips from just kind of left to right will just give you that sort of panning action as well. If you want to... If all of that isn't precise enough for you, uh, you can look at camera sliders, they're called. Um, and they're relatively inexpensive online unless you start going up to the mechanized one. And what they are is that if, you, if you've ever seen kind of like a big feature film, they've got a camera dolly, which is when it's on tracks and it moves across. Well, what you can do is you can get smaller versions, which are about kind of, you can go up to like six feet or something like that. Um, but usually you can get ones that are about kind of two, three feet, which sit on top of your tripod and you mount the camera on that and you could slide it across in one smooth action or you can tilt it and bring it across. And that will just add a little bit of kind of production value to you. And it means that you can be way more precise with it rather than kind of worrying about any inaccuracies. Really, it's, then it's just about getting that smooth uh, action across. So camera slider. Brilliant, thank you. Um, next question from Becky. Do you have any top tips for using a variety of shots to make dance films? Um, and this was an activity she was going to set with the students. Um, so for example, she said like top shot, close up, extreme long shot, panning, etc. cetera. Um, I mean, you sound like you know shots there anyway. So uh, <laughs> the most important thing really uh, in the exercise is you can have those shots, but how are they going to work together? Why are you going from a wide shot to a top shot? What's that going to show? Uh, how does going from a wide shot to a close-up, how do those things work together? And do they feel jarring? Or if it does feel jarring, do you want it to feel jarring? That's really the most important thing uh, using these tools in filmmaking, is what do you want to do with and how do you want to put them together? So really the thing, I mean, it sounds like you know your shots and um, I think, just going on a slight tangent here, I think uh, the style of dance that you're gonna do really informs the way you film it as well. So, uh, not naming anything, <laughs> I work with a lot of ballet companies, um, national ballet companies and the language and terminology between uh, what is present in and ballet and the understanding of it and the filming of it 
is different to filmic understanding of the foot. And that's purely due to the fact of what they want out of things. So ballet is about form, it's about precision, it's about seeing full bodies. Now, when they, when someone says in ballet, oh yeah, I want things to feel tight and close. When I think of that, I think real kind of closer. But for them, it means so all you're getting is one body on the stage because everything is still really important to the whole body. As soon as you start filming close up in ballet, you're doing something different. You're making something more filmic and more tonal, which, which I do a lot of, and uh, usually for trailers. But usually we have to cut two trailers. One's a more poor performance trailer so that people who really appreciate ballet can see all the form and they can see the full stage and they can see what's happening. But then we do another trailer that is more filmic, where we film from different angles, where we can see faces better, where we film more from the side. And that will maybe attract people who aren't necessarily as into ballet, but they just like watching a good, exciting performance, and that will catch their eyes more. So really, uh, I've gone on a real tangent, so to bring it back around, really it's about thinking about, you've got these different um, perspectives, these different kind of angles, and these different lenses and things like that. How are they gonna to work together? And do some exercises with them about, okay, if we cut from the mid to the wide, what does that do? If they're cutting on an action to something go from, why would you go from a close up to something a wide as well? Thank you, Craig. Um, we have a quick question about um, filming outside, and this might be more for the process around UDANCE applications. And just to answer that quickly, um, for filming outside, you might want to create a dance film, in which case, um, by all means, come to our webinar next week, which is all about creating a piece of screen dance. Um, but very quickly, Craig, do you have any tips for people who are, might be filming outside in their work? Yeah, um, check the weather. <laughs> it's really, it's, it sounds silly. It's really important, especially this time of year. My, yeah, keep an eye on the weather and um, keep people warm, lots of coats, uh, think about places where people are going to get changed. I mean, I'm, I'm going off on a bit of kind of, it's not specifically with dance, but this is, these are really important things. Dancers have to keep warm. They have to keep, uh, they have to, you know, have lots of food and water as well, ready. Just be prepared to do that. That if you're going out in a forest or on a beach or wherever, you're going to deal with these problems and how you're going to prevent and how you're going to prevent them and how you're going to have a duty of care to these dancers that you're working with um the biggest really thing uh and i can give another example i i, I did some filming in uh malvern next to the malvern hills and we planned out the whole day and what time and because we were filming outside uh, and it was on one side, just on one side of the Malvern Hills. And we thought, okay, well, we've got until about 6.30 till the sun goes down because we wanted natural light and everything. But we didn't take into the fact that we're on the uh, east side of the Malvern Hills. Sunset's in the west, which means it blocks out most of the light. So from about 4.35, we were going to lose light. And I only clocked it when it started, this looming shadow started appearing. So we had to rush everything. So really just think about the way light is used in the space. What, at what time is the sun overhead? What time is it going to set? Uh, how does shadows change during that time as well? It, it, the shadows of trees suddenly going to start appearing, which if you want that, it can look quite cool. But really just kind of thinking about it. If you're in a big field, then, you know, that's not as much of a problem. But yeah, just take your time thinking about the environmental conditions around you as well. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for two more. Um, Segaline asks um, about keeping and deleting footage and any best practice advice on this. For example, would you normally just keep the footage that made to the final edit or would you keep everything just in case? And she goes dot, dot, dot at the end. The just <laughs> <laughs> That's quite ominous. Um, so my process uh, for footage is that, um, this is quite boring and logistical, but spare me so let's say we found something i've got the sd card or uh, i've got it on my phone or something uh i back it up twice so i have two separate hard drives or maybe uh, i back it up on my computer which i'm going to work from and then i have a hard drive as well which i back up from so there's always two copies 
of it, which means that if either one fails, I've always got a backup. Uh, I keep double backups for six months. Um, and I keep, after that, I've got, a, there's another three months on top of that. Um, just, yeah, I always, always kind of keep original footage when I can. I never get rid of things. Um, it makes me, I've got about, I've got a stock of about 20 hard drives just beneath me here. And it does take up a lot of space. Um, and I would really recommend, um, at the moment, what I've been doing a lot of is investing in uh, cloud storage as well. So if I'm working on a project, uh, I've got Google Drive and I've got things that link up. So, and I'll just leave that backing up overnight. I only use, because it, you know, that adds up and it's quite expensive. Um, but I think I've got about a terabyte, which costs me about seven pounds a month of Google, um, Google Drive. But it means that whenever I'm working on a project, I back up to there and I know that it's always going to be there. As soon as I finish that project, I delete it from the Google Drive. But the thing is, if you're filming on your phone or on a tablet, you can automate that as well to the cloud. So it means that, you know, if you've got a kid or something like that and they want to go on the iPad and they delete something or something like that, it's always going to have that backup there. I just, I, I always keep original files and yeah, check your hard drives work as well and make sure you get some good reviewed hard drives too. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. And the final question um, is from Lucy. Uh, would you recommend using effects on editing software, such as zooming in, or is it better to try and create that effect live when you're filming with the camera? It depends on what you want to do. Uh, I know I keep saying this, but, you know, you may, when, when you zoom, so a bit of just kind of theory here, when you zoom in with a camera or when you move the camera closer to someone, I should say. So uh, when you do a shot, which it's called a dolly in, so that's moving the, close, the camera close to someone, it will change the perspective around them and it will feel like you are getting closer to them. That is different to a zoom or a digital zoom. Digital zoom is what you will do in an edit when you increase the size of the image. If you put the two side by side, they will feel different. One will feel like, yeah, you're the the object, your sub, sorry, your subject of the film is getting close to the camera, so it starts feeling more intimate. Their face will ever so slightly change, and it, you may not know why, but you will feel like you're getting close to them. Whereas if it's a digital image, it will still have that same perspective on it. So really, it's not an issue <clears throat> if you want that and you don't mind that look, it's not a problem, but it will, it will never feel as intimate as putting a camera closer to someone. Um, I've used, something I use all the time that I mentioned before is that when, um, when I film full scale performances, uh, usually we shoot in four or six K. And what that means is that when I take it into the edit, um, usually our delivery is uh, HD quality. But if I shoot 4K, that means I can zoom in digitally four times the amount and it will still be the same quality as HD, if that makes sense. So just imagine like if, if, my, if my screen is a 4K screen here with me on there, I could cut it out of it into four and this is a HD video, this is a HD video, blah, blah, blah. And so I can zoom into that amount and it will still be HD crystal sharp. But and what that allows me to do is that when, uh, when I have a performance of a full stage, so that's usually when we use like a 6K camera, I can crop into about two thirds of the stage and pan it across and digitally move around the stage afterwards. But in actuality, it's just a locked off shot. So I guess my kind of thoughts on that is if it's in the wide, it really works. Um, and you won't notice the difference. But as soon as you start zooming in and out noticeably, something may not kind of feel right if it's kind of mid shot. You can shoot in 4K or something on like, uh, and I, we do it a lot actually, is we shoot in 4K for just kind of like a, a mid shot of a person. And then what we might do is we might um, do an edit. And if you come back to the person, you've digitally punched in what's called, so you've cropped in to them there and you've enlarged it and it just gives a different tone and a different feel and it feels like it's coming to a different camera angle but really you're just kind of cheating around it but yeah it's the it's how you want to do movement 
I think, is the big thing and how that movement feels. Thank you um, for that brilliant answer. And also just generally for so much information, uh, which I'm sure um, was relevant uh, to everyone watching um, on some level. And uh, yeah, just a brilliant, a brilliant insight into the kind of multifaceted world of um, creating dance, creating filming dance for stage. Um, for those of you who are watching who are um, looking to take part in New Dance next year, I'm just going to put a few links in the chat for you. Um, we have the, some information just generally about our New Dance regional platforms. And then we really recommend before applying to read the guidance notes, which are here as well. That's the other link I'm putting in there. Um, and when you, one particular thing to, to note for everyone who is applying is around music licensing and the legalities of streaming music online. We've actually got a, a special um, guidance notes sheet for you on that as well, because that might be something you've not come across before if you haven't created work that is made for online or filming. So um, please do take a, a, a look at those, uh, those links. All the information is on the One Dance UK website as well. And now I'll hand over to Laura to, um, to wrap up the session. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Craig, for a really useful, helpful, informative session. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, and thanks to everyone who's attended tonight and for your fantastic questions. Um, this session will be available on our YouTube channel. So if there's anything you want to look back at, you are very welcome to do that. If any questions come to mind after this session, please do drop us an email at info at onedanceuk.org. That's info at onedanceuk.org. So feel free to drop us any questions there. Um, and hopefully we'll see lots of you at next week's session where we're focusing on entries for you dance on screen. So creating um, screen dance pieces that are specifically made to be viewed um, as a dance film. So we look forward to seeing lots of you there. Please keep in touch. If there's anything we can help with, drop us a line and have a lovely week. Thanks everyone. Bye.